the world's leading infectious killer of children under the age of five years is still pneumonia. Pneumonia, a common respiratory illness, also has potentially serious outcomes for the elderly. The most vulnerable children are in poor and rural communities, underlying the need to improve equitable access to high quality care, diagnostics, and treatment for all children and elderly as well. I welcome you all to this special webinar with experts on how we can end preventable deaths from pneumonia and keep the promises our governments have made for delivering on the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Special thanks to IVAC, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Dr. Ajay Mishra of Nelson Hospital of India, both of whom are represented in today's webinar. Just to remind you all, CNS had documented a series of interviews of parents and care providers of children with pneumonia in 2011. This publication, edited by me, is available in English, Hindi, and Urdu, and we will share the links of that with, along with the webinar recording. Before we begin, let me make a few quick announcements. Panelists are requested to please present in time. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait. Just type your questions by using the chat function or raise your virtual hand. We will take questions as they stream in during the question and answer session. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsaru, a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa. Over to you, Ashok. I bring you warm greetings from Durban, South Africa. Well, friends, how can a disease that is preventable and treatable be the biggest cause of deaths of children under five years of age? Governments have committed to achieve sustainable development goals by 2030, one of which promises to end preventable deaths of newborns and children under five years of age by 2030. We will fail to deliver on SDGs if we forget pneumonia. Pneumonia also affects adults, particularly the elderly. Top reason for people living with HIV ending up in the intensive care units of hospitals is not heart disease or accident, but pneumonia. Let me introduce the panel of experts. Dr. Kate O'Brien, Executive Director and Professor, International Vaccine Access Center, IVAC, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Steve Graham, Professor of International Child Health, University of Melbourne, Australia, and a senior child health expert with the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, or the Union. Audrey M. Batu, Director, Essential Medicines, Clinton Health Access Initiative, or CHAI, and Dr. Ajay Misra, Senior Director and Head of Pediatrics, Nelson Hospital, India, and of course, not forgetting, our CNS Managing Editor, Shobha Shukla. Well, we be we will begin with our first panelist, Audrey Batu, Director, Essential Medicine, Clinton Health Access Initiative, or CHI. It's now over to Dr. Audrey. First, I uh, just want to say thank you um, for CNS for organizing this webinar. It's a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about scaling up access to pneumonia treatment as well as protection and prevention. Um, so first, I just wanted to share a little bit about CHI. So CHAI is a global health organization, and we are committed to strengthening and expanding access to care and treatment in the developing world. So we are a solution-oriented nonprofit, um, and we focus on market dynamics to lower prices for treatment, as well as accelerating access. So if you're interested in more about CHAI, our website is www.clintonhealthaccess.org, and we are driven by this set of values that are projected on your screen. Um, which are fundamental to our work and support our change-oriented agenda. 
Next, I want to share just a little bit about our pneumonia interventions, just an introduction and an overview. Um, as others will share, pneumonia is the number one killer of children under five in the developing world, and that's a point that really bears repeating. Uh, pneumonia is the leading cause of death for children globally. It takes more lives annually than HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. Um, however, many, many cases can be prevented by vaccines, which I know Kate will speak a little bit more about. And then Chai has been working to scale up access to vaccines in a number of countries since 2011, um, particularly um, PCV. And then for those cases that cannot be prevented by vaccines, um, we're in support of amoxicillin dispersible tablets, or amoxDT, which is the recommended treatment by the WHO for bacterial pneumonia. And we're also supporting oxygen, which can be used to treat severe cases of pneumonia, and pulse oximetry, um, which is used to monitor a patient's oxygen levels and can be used to diagnose hypoxemia, which is an oxygen deficiency. So I'm sharing today the second aspect of this, which is really treatment. So CHAI is currently working at the global level and also in three focal countries to increase access to and correct usage of pneumonia treatment. Um, at the global level, we are part of the Diarrhea and Pneumonia Working Group, which was formed in 2011 and focuses on the acceleration of treatment. Uh, scale up across 10 high burden countries. And then CHAI began its work focusing on treatment for diarrhea and then moved into treatment for pneumonia in the past 18 months. In 2017, CHAI will be working in Ethiopia, India, Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Uganda to scale up access to treatment. But today I'm just going to highlight the work in Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Uganda, which has already begun. So we, in analyzing the data for CHAI, there are five broad areas that have emerged as priorities for intervention on pneumonia treatment, and this is based on existing gaps. Um, so the first step is to ensure that there is an enabling policy environment. So as an example, we work to make sure that there are policies in place that guide relevant treatment. So for instance, making sure that amoxDT is recommended as the first line treatment for pneumonia. Second, there's a need to improve early care seeking. So ensuring that mothers seek care rapidly when their ch children have danger signs. Third is to make sure a diagnosis is improved for pneumonia and hypoxemia. So making sure there's access to respiratory rate counters and pulse oximetry, and also making sure that new products are accelerated. Fourth is making sure that we improve management of non-severe pneumonia with amoxicillin DT. Um, and this means improving the supply and then also ensuring that the prescriptions are made correctly. Finally, there's a a need to improve adequate management of severe illness at facility level. And in particular, this is focusing on oxygen. Um, the availability of oxygen could significantly decrease deaths from pneumonia, but many countries have poor access to treatment, especially at the facility level. So just sharing a little bit more about um, countries in particular. Um, First, at the global level, uh, CHAI has put together a frontline health worker kit and a caregiver kit for pneumonia. So these are open source free materials. They're available for all users and they help health workers and parents understand the signs and symptoms of pneumonia. Um, so if you go to the website www.lifesavingcommodities.org slash pneumonia, there's educational posters, there's a caregiver flyer, health worker training, and also it's available in different languages so you can adapt it um, to whatever needs you have. Now at the country level, so first in Ethiopia, so pneumonia is the biggest killer of children under five in Ethiopia and it contributes to 18% of deaths for children and coverage for antibiotics remains incredibly low in Ethiopia as well as oxygen availability and access to pulse oximetry. However, it is a priority area for the government of Ethiopia underneath their national newborn and child survival strategy. So CHAI has been working in Ethiopia with the Federal Ministry of Health to increase access to treatment. 
The government of Ethiopia recently launched their landmark National Oxygen and Pulse Oximetry Roadmap, which will dramatically improve access to uh, life-saving commodities, including oxygen, as well as pulse oximetry. So the CHAI program in Ethiopia is really focused on optimizing policies, strengthening the supply chain system, and also providing procurement support to the government. And our overall goal in Ethiopia is to improve access to treatment, which will save lives. CHAI is also working in Uganda, where approximately 14,000 children die each year from pneumonia, and there is poor access to oxygen, pulse oximetry, and amoxicillin DT. We also found that frequently the wrong treatment was being prescribed, and many cases of severe pneumonia were not reaching the higher level facilities, but also once they reached there, there was suboptimal severe case management, especially with use of oxygen. Oxygen was prioritized by the government in a 2014 implementation framework, um, but has started to be addressed more aggressively starting in 2016. So this, this past year, CHI has been supporting the ministry in scaling up access to treatment in three key areas. First is improving access to amoxicillin DT. So working with the government to change guidelines and also ensure that suppliers and local manufacturers are ready to supply amoxicillin DT to the market. Second is improving referral, so ensuring that cases of severe pneumonia are referred up where they'll have access to more appropriate treatment. And then finally, national work to improve oxygen availability and utilization. So really exciting news in the past year is that the Ministry of Health is making an investment to support construction of 13 new oxygen plants for a total of 15 oxygen plants nationwide, um, which is really exciting to see. Finally, in Nigeria, where pneumonia is the second leading cause of under five mortality, the case fatality rates are twice the average as other high burden countries. So it's a pretty significant burden in Nigeria. In Nigeria, Chai has been working with the government to create favorable policies for treatment, so including the support of Nigeria's first national level oxygen strategy, and also implementing these policy changes at the state level in Kaduna, Kano, and Niger. And then finally, working with the government to support planning for the financial resources that they'll need to meet these requirements. So in closing, please just join us to uh, commit to increasing the number of children receiving treatment for pneumonia. There are five ways that we would highlight in regards to treatment. First, you can support governments with smart and targeted investments, which will help them build on their successes. Second, you can increase access to vaccines essential me and essential medicines, which include amoxicillin, DT, and oxygen. Third, we need to continue to innovate and focus on solutions that will work in resource-limited settings. Fourth, we need to provide healthcare workers with the tools that they need to accurately diagnose and enable treatment. And finally, we need to properly equip caregivers with the knowledge that they need to act on behalf of their children. Um, the slides will be shared out, so if you have any questions about any of the references or here, or feel free to send any questions my way. Thank you. Thank you. That was Audrey M. Bachu, um, Director, Essential Medicines, Clinton Health Access Initiative, or CHI. Well, moving on, our next panelist is Dr. Kate O'Brien, Executive, Executive Director and Professor, International Vaccine Access Center, IVAC, at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Citizen News and the Union both are part of the Global Coalition Against Childhood Pneumonia. Well, it's over to you, uh, Dr. Kate O'Brien. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Kate, we can hear you very clearly. Good, excellent. I'm sharing my screen now. I'm so pleased to be with all of you, and apologies for the crash of my computer just as the um, webinar was starting, but I've recovered. Um, <laughs> so what I would um, really love to share with you is about how we can accelerate progress in reducing the death toll of um, childhood pneumonia. Um, and what I think we'll do is um, move on to some figures that um, just show the significant progress that we've made already um, in the reduction of under five deaths from 1980 to 2015. 
And you can see in this figure that the total deaths of children under five have gone down from 20 million to just under 6 million. Um, the diarrheal deaths have also gone down by tenfold. And what we're mostly focusing on, of course, in this webinar is the reduction in pneumonia deaths, which have gone from 4 million um, down to under a million deaths, so a reduction of over 80%. And I'm going to talk about um, not only pneumonia, but also diarrhea, and you'll, you'll see a little bit um, why that's the case. So this is the, um, the distribution of the causes of death of children outside the neonatal period in the 1 to 59 month age group. And you can see that together, diarrhea and pneumonia account for about 40% of the global deaths in um, around the world. So with pneumonia being the, the most prominent one and diarrhea coming second. And um, when you include the neonates, um, these two syndromes still account for um, about one and a half million deaths. And these together um, are more than the HIV, TB, Zika, Ebola, and malaria deaths combined. Um, yet so much of our attention and popular media focuses on um, these other pathogens that are certainly important. There's no question about that, but I think we leave behind the pneumonia and diarrhea ones. Now, people of any age in any country are at risk of, of either of these illnesses, but the vast majority of all childhood deaths occur in countries that are poor or in poor populations um, within um, uh, less poor countries. And, and the good news is that we do know how to protect and prevent and treat pneumonia and diarrhea, but we have to ensure that those strategies are actually implemented, um, as we've heard about in the past two talks. So there is an integrated plan to prevent both pneumonia and diarrhea, um, establishing good health practices from birth for protection of children, preventing them from becoming ill through vaccines, um, sanitation, safe drinking water, prevention of HIV, and um, appropriately um, preventing um, causes in children who are HIV infected, and then treating children who fail the protection and prevention strategies and actually do become ill. So the reason I'm talking about both diarrhea and pneumonia is um, shown in this simple slide here. And that is that um, the strategies for preventing and treating pneumonia, you can see here. And when you line them up against the strategies um, to prevent diarrhea, um, we see something very, um, very similar. And here you see the diarrhea strategies. And if we just underline the ones that are similar across the two, you can see that by doing one, we actually accomplish many of the strategies in the other. So these are really integrated. And from the perspective of a child or a mother or a father, um, it makes no sense to, um, uh, to approach these two um, syndromes as if they're completely separate. So at IVAC, we've, um, annually we produce a pneumonia and diarrhea progress report, um, which we uh, issue publicly on World Pneumonia Day each year. And I'd like to go through some of the findings from the 2016 progress report, um, which is really about reaching goals through action and innovation. What we do in this report is we look at 10 interventions um, that are quantitative evalu quantitatively evaluated in countries, and we produce a score, which is we just call the GAP-D score. Um, and this is the average of the coverage of these 10 interventions within countries. And what we use this for is to assess and compare the progress of countries over time in those 15 countries that have the greatest number of pneumonia and diarrhea deaths. Um, and then we look at these average national scores um, uh, using the most recently available data. So the first point I want to make, um, and is, is highlighted in red here, is that 72% of the global burden of pneumonia and diarrhea deaths occurs in just a few countries and they're home to only 55% of the world's under five population. So a substantial disproportionate amount of the burden is borne by a small, smaller number of children. There are 12 countries out of the 15 that have actually improved their GAPD score since 2015. Um, and the three that are left out are China, Somalia, and Pakistan, which have not made progress. 
Um, there are only six of these high burden countries, um, which are listed on the slide, Angola, Ethiopia, India, Niger, Sudan, and Tanzania, that have actually introduced rotavirus vaccine to prevent diarrhea in their routine immunization program. So nine of these 15 have not yet done that. And only five of the highest pneumonia burden countries um, listed here, here are still not using PCV. So 10 out of the 15 have actually introduced PCV um, to prevent the most common cause of pneumonia mortality. So um, the, the, um, the next point that, that I'd like to make um, is that we'll show here on this slide the actual GAP-D scores of these countries. And the bottom two countries are Somalia and Tanzania, and these represent the country with the lowest score and the highest score. The other countries are distributed in between those, but importantly, not one of these countries has actually met the target of 86%, which would be the, the coverage, the average coverage of the targets from the Global Action Plan for Pneumonia and Diarrhea um, that these that countries should be should be meeting. So every country has progress that it can make. Um, some are closer than others. So how do we actually reduce the death toll? Um, just to going through things that can be done within these categories under the protection as well as prevention and treatment category. I've listed health system strengthening there. That's sort of the overarching thing that can be done. From a prevention perspective, countries need to fully introduce and use pneumococcal conjugate vaccine against pneumococcus, the most common cause of death um, among children with pneumonia, Hib vaccine, measles, and other vaccines um, that can allow for prevention of pneumonia. Um, reduction of indoor air pollution is also um, a key metric as well as the potential to introduce new vaccines which are not yet um, licensed or licensed but not necessarily recommended for infants. Under the treatment category, there are lots of interventions, um, some of which Audrey has um, reviewed in the previous talk, including access to amoxicillin um, dispersible tablets, improved management of the cases of pneumonia that present to facilities using this very simple technique called pulse ox to um, measure how much oxygen is in the blood, and for those children who don't have enough oxygen in their blood, having access to oxygen therapy. Um, I've mentioned already the access to amoxicillin dispersible tablets. The bubble CPAP, which is a way of supporting children who have um, severe respiratory distress um, where there are no um, uh, mechanical ventilation machines in hospitals. Improving the diagnosis of the causes of pneumonia um, would be one method for also improving how we treat children, so treating only those children who have bacterial causes with antibiotics and not those children who don't have a bacterial disease. Ultrasounds of the chest could be um, important for detecting those children with pneumonia. At present, we rely on the use of chest x-ray, but those are certainly not available in the vast majority of facilities, and so we're deeply reliant on just the clinical distinction of those children who do and do, don't have pneumonia, which is an imperfect um, art and not really a science. And then other ways of detecting the difference between a bacterial cause of pneumonia and a non-bacterial cause. I want to focus on the vaccines in particular. Um, and the reason is that we don't always um, quantify the full public health value of vaccines. And this is just a, an evaluation that's been done of the return on investment for the introduction of vaccines, inclusive of those vaccines um, that are um, protective against pneumonia, compared with um, other strategies for um, public health, public health infrastructure, preschool education, community health workers, all of these have very high value. But vaccines have this incredible return on investment, either 16-fold if we only consider the cost of illness, or 44-fold the, the, the return on the investments that made in vaccines using a full income approach. So if we look then and drill down a little bit more on how we're doing with vaccine introductions, this is a map showing that every country in the world except for um, China and Thailand are using um, Hib vaccine um, for protection against uh, uh, Hib pneumonia. The next slide shows 
also remarkable progress in the introduction of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, with the vast majority of countries having introduced vaccines, some um, pace still to pick up in the South Asia region. Um, but we can see on the next slide that there are decisions from countries, 19 countries are planning introductions, leaving only 37 countries in the world that have made no decision on introduction of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. We also should um, pay attention to the sort of big global targets, um, the sustainable development goals, which have replaced the Millennium Development Goals, and recognize that although pneumonia would fall largely into the third um, sustainable development goal, good health and well-being, we should recognize that you really can't get to um, any of the first six sustainable development goals without addressing the number one cause of mortality in young children, um, which is pneumonia. So just in conclusion, um, globally enormous strides have been made in reducing pneumonia and diarrheal mortality and morbidity, but we still um, are burdened with over a million and a half children who die every single year and millions of children who are hospitalized that result in enormous economic and social burden, often throwing families into poverty or sustaining their poverty status because of the health needs of their children from these preventable illnesses. There are many powerful strategies available, but we really do need a coordinated and comprehensive approach um, if we're going to achieve optimal results. And first and foremost, I think we've seen over and over again that political will accountability of that political will and community engagement and mobilization are really key to implementing these powerful strategies. So at IVAC, we would call on all countries to protect their ch children's health and well-being through action and innovation to accelerate progress in combating pneumonia and diarrhea. And um, I'll, I'll leave it there with um, the website for Stop Pneumonia and uh, the Facebook page. So thanks for, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Kate O'Brien, Executive Director and Professor, International Vaccine Access Center, IVA, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Well, Dr. O'Brien set the stage for us to listen to our final panelist and Q&A, Dr. Ajay Misra, Senior Director and Head of the Pediatrics at India's famous Nelson Hospital. Dr. Misra has set high standards of patient-oriented care in pediatrics. Well, welcome to Dr. Misra and over to you now. Hello. Yes, hello. We can hear you, Dr. Misra. Yes. Uh, being the last speaker, as we know, pneumonia is a small word, but a big task. When I talk about word, especially India, one of the most populated country. I can't imagine how to stop pneumonia. Even a layman know pneumonia by word, but how to prevent, they don't know what they don't want to do. Though treatment is available, maximum data are available, but where is the fault? Why even today this disease is number one cause of death in children below five years of age? As mentioned by Steve, the risk factors, poor immunization, poor nutrition leading to low birth rates, malnutrition, no breastfeed, low socioeconomics like overcrowding and hygiene, underlying diseases like cardiac, HIV and neuro are the main risk factors of the pneumonia. So to stop pneumonia, we have to minimize the risk factor. But again, the question arises how? To stop pneumonia, as we know the facts, is the number one killer. Mm -hmm. Most, more than 90% of all the pneumonia deaths occur in developing countries, out of which 50% of the world pneumonia deaths occur in India. Low vaccination coverage and high child mortality. India is among the four out of the 15 countries that are yet to introduce the newest generation of pneumococcal vaccine in their immunization schedule. Interventions. The majority of the pneumonia cases are preventable or treatable. 
expanded and improved data collection efforts are urgently needed to inform decision making at the country and global levels. More targeted, effective work is needed to scale up life-saving interventions and protect the world's most vulnerable children from their devastating toll of pneumonia. Public-private partnership <coughs> should be utilized to implement the global action plan for prevention and control of pneumonia. That is GAP. Prevention, global action, and prevention plan. There are seven components, which includes hip, pneumococcal, measles, pertussis, and appropriate healthcare provider, exclusive breastfeeding, access to antibiotics. While none of these developing countries have reached the 90% cap target, as mentioned earlier, for each intervention, India, one of the largest countries with the highest numbers of child deaths, worldwide remains a low scorer and an average intervention coverage rate of 55% to protect against pneumonia. Parent education program we should organize. Community awareness of the practice of the personal hygiene, strengthening birth and unit care, empowerment of community health workers, encouragement of exclusive breast feeding. Now, as mentioned earlier, the other speakers also, the treatment of the pneumonia. As we have know the treatment, early diagnosis, which is the key of better outcome. Community acquired pneumonia is a clinical diagnosis. Tachypnea associated and respiratory distress and grunt being as good or better than auscultation as a tool for diagnosis. Use of appropriate antibiotics, that is amoxicillin, amoxiclave, and third generation parental cephalosporins and macrolides as applicable and useful. According to WHO classification, it has been classified into two. No danger sign and fit danger sign. No danger sign means fast breathing and chest in drawing. Can be managed as outpatient with oral amoxicillin. And severe pneumonia with danger sign, that is if cyanosis or other signs are present. Ampicillin plus gentamicin and oxygen therapy, as mentioned earlier, is very important in treating the severe pneumonia. Septic zone or also the second line of choice. So thank you. Hello. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, uh, yeah. Doctor. That was Dr. Ajay Mishra, Senior Director and Head of Pediatrics, Nelson Hospital, India. Earlier, the Gremlin crept in as Dr. Steve Wang was addressing us and it affected our sound quality. Well, Let's get back Dr. Steve Graham, who is a senior professor of international child health, University of Melbourne, Australia, and a senior child health expert with the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, or the Union, has helped CNS raise child health issues consistently. He's also the lead author of Game Changing First Ever Child TB Roadmap, which was launched a couple of years ago. Well, it's over to Dr. Graham. Welcome back. Okay, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay without any interference? Yes, we can hear you without interference. Okay, yes. great. I mean, I'm, just, I'm not going to go through the slides. I, I think we've used up enough time already and um, others, previous speakers have already covered, I think, one of the important issues. Um, and my, in trying to complement um, the discussion that, that actually has happened. I was, I was just trying to implement, um, highlight a number of the case management issues and um, the first is that I think that we have a challenge in terms of case management in relation to the use of antibiotics. This is a particular problem um, I think in the Asian region where there's a huge burden of pneumonia or lower respiratory tract infection, um, 
that is probably not due to bacterial pneumonia and hospitalization and antibiotic use is, is a major challenge um, given that we're all very concerned about the antimicrobial resistance issues. And I'd also like to highlight that as uh, Kate, Kate talked about the impact of vaccines, there are certainly in many countries still uncertain about the potential of vaccines and I think they're very important including um, in, in, in all of the high burden countries and there's evidence to suggest that that they still make that they will make a, a very big difference to the burden of pneumonia um, including in the Asia Pacific is that um, once we have coverage of vaccines what then becomes the major issues for case management in terms of antibiotic use and there are still a number of groups that we still have challenges and this would include the newborns and the severe, severely malnourished children who are particularly prone to gram-negative um, causes of pneumonia which are not covered by the current WHO case management guidelines. Um, pathogens such as Klebsiella and Acinetobacter are not uncommon in these groups and they're often very multi-drug resistant and associated with a very high mortality and are often nosocomial infections um, as, new, as preterm newborns and very malnourished children are, are, are admitted to facilities and managed in that context. There's also other pathogens that the current case management for antibiotics will not be able to treat. One of them, for example, is tuberculosis. So I think we are becoming increasingly aware that tuberculosis can cause acute severe pneumonia as a primary pathogen or a co-infection, particularly in infants, particularly in HIV endemic settings. Um, autopsy and clinical studies show that it's a common pathogen and we need to improve our detection of tuberculosis in children presenting with severe pneumonia. And then in certain contexts, and this is rather specific to malaria endemic Africa, other pathogens such as Salmonella, which is a very important cause of invasive bacterial disease, often presenting with clinical pneumonia um, and increasingly multi-drug resistant is also a, an important cause to consider. So I think as we, as we start to improve our antibiotic treatment and certainly prevention for the common pathogens of pneumococcus and haemophilus, we are going to have to start to consider the importance of other pathogens. The other, so clearly point of, it would be wonderful as Kate alluded to, to have improved point of care diagnostics. So if we knew what the pathogens might be for each particular child who came in with the clinical presentation of severe pneumonia, that would be a huge step forward. And there is work being done in this area, of course, but I think we're a long way away from having um, better diagnostics to identify what the actual cause of pneumonia is. It's important in terms of prevention, it's important in terms of treatment. One thing that unites all cases of pneumonia in terms of the risk of mortality is hypoxemia and Audrey has already talked about the work that Chai is doing and I think this is really important work. I think work done here more locally in Papua New Guinea has shown previously that just the provision of pulse oximetry to detect hypoxemia and oxygen concentrators to treat, to provide oxygen therapy can reduce pneumonia mortality 
in a very high pneumonia burden, high mortality setting such as Papua New Guinea can reduce the mortality by 30 per cent. This may not be the case in, 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 in all settings but I think we all recognise the importance of improved management of hypoxemia. Two, the, the, the two major um, interventions to improve in case management is the provision of antibiotics and the provision of oxygen therapy. So I, I'd just like to emphasise that again. There are challenges. Many settings do not have oxygen therapy or even oximetry. And even in situations where you have concentrators, there are problems of electricity supply which make it a very difficult, sustainable um, intervention. It's certainly more cost effective than relying on cylinders, but we still need to do better in terms of the provision of oxygen therapy. And some of the work that's being done is using solar energy, which I think is uh, to, to get around the problems of electricity supply. But there's also some work that I wanted to highlight that's where oxygen can be supplied through just um, the, the relying on running water and, and a system that, that allows oxygen extraction from running water, which doesn't require electricity supply. So I think that's a really important area um, for the future is the provision of oxygen for treatment of child pneumonia. And it's not just child pneumonia, it's, it's severe illnesses in many um, children, neonates, etc., where oxygen is very important. So just to sum up, I would like to emphasise that there's still evidence that we could do a lot in reducing child pneumonia mortality by just applying the um, technology or what the, the, the antibiotics, the oxygen for improved training, for improved recognition of, of severe pneumonia, for improved case management. And so my experience in Malawi was that one of the first Gates funded projects back in 2000 was the Malawi Child Lung Health Project which implemented case management of pneumonia in all district hospitals in Malawi um, including over 40,000 children with pneumonia. And what that found was that starting with a baseline case uh, mortality of around 15 to 17 percent in district hospitals in Malawi just by applying WHO case management, making sure that antibiotics were available, implementing oxygen therapy, training the staff to recognise and treat oxygen, they were able to reduce mortality to 8% and more recently, the most recent analysis, and this has been um, something that has been built into the Ministry of Health pneumonia management so it's a sustainable program. The more recent analysis is that the mortality is now down to 4.5 percent for case management. There have been many other important advances over the period of time such as the uh, there are less children now being born with HIV, there is less impact of the more high mortality of HIV related pneumonia. But I do think that even from the early stages in the first couple of years, it was able to show that you can reduce child pneumonia mortality just by applying um, the case management recommendations, guidelines that are, that are current. Um, and so that's an important point to finish. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Steve Graham, Professor of International Child Health, University of Melbourne, Australia, and a senior child health expert with the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease of the Union. Well, it's a good time to open the floor for Q&A. Participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function. 
or raise your virtual hand to request to speak. Let's begin the Q&A. It's over now to our Citizen News Services Managing Editor, yes, Shobai thank Shukla. You, thank you, Ashok. We have Dr. Basor from Nigeria who wants to ask a question. Dr. Basore, are you there? Yes. Hello, thank you very much. Yes, please ask your question, yes. I, I wrote them. I wrote them. Maybe let me see again. Yes, please ask. Yeah, one of my questions is the, the well, one of the speakers told us that uh, operating in Somalia. And we know Somalia is one of the uh, fragile states. Uh, what is the experience and the, how are you managing the challenges? I think that question is for Audrey. Would you like to answer? Audrey or Kate? Any one of you? Yeah, Chai actually does not have any operations in Somalia. Um, Chai works directly in partnership with governments, and that's a very important relationship for us to have before we would proceed in setting up a program in a country. So at this point, we don't have um, we don't have operations in Somalia. And this is Kate, and I wonder if I could just add something to this. Um, I think you're raising a very important point um, that is not unique to Somalia, but about children in conflict zones and uh, displaced people. And I think we have to recognize that um, providing um, the kinds of interventions and prevention strategies to children who are at incredibly high risk because of those um, geopolitical aspects is something that I think we're all concerned is going to continue to increase um, in the, the, you know, over the, the coming um, years and, and, uh, and is something that as a global community we all have to um, provide leadership on and strategies. And I think coming from Nigeria, you probably also have um, domestic um, issues around some of the relatively inaccessible parts of the country that, that you're facing as well. So I think you're just raising a very important point about um, those children who are at highest risk from displacement or humanitarian emergencies. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question for Steve uh, from Zafar of Bangladesh. Uh, uh, Zafar says, uh, you referred to TB in relation to pneumonia in children. Can you elaborate? Are the sim symptoms similar? Do they coexist? Dr. Steve, Dr. Dan, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what we're understanding is that um, children, particularly infants, and particularly HIV-infected infants, can present. TB as an acute severe pneumonia. Um, I think we've always known that, particularly in infants, that TB can present as an acute severe pneumonia, um, which may not be recognised. And I think the important clinical question, because infants often get their tuberculosis infection from someone very close to them, is around t tuberculosis contact. Um, this is not. This is increasingly being recognised by UNICEF and others as an important part of the assessment of a child with severe pneumonia is whether they might have a contact with tuberculosis. Um, but I think I think that often it goes unrecognised because tuberculosis is always thought of as the diagnosis we consider when the child has been coughing or failing to thrive for more than two or three weeks. Um, but if that's, that, that's often not the scenario in, in, in particularly infants and HIV infected infants in TB endemic settings. So I think there's still more work that needs to be done. The problem is that 
we don't have really good diagnostics, we don't have really sensitive diagnostics to know what the burden of TB is in infants with pneumonia, but in the studies that have been done, and these are mainly in hospitalised children in African settings, that bacteriologically confirm TB, and there's also autopsy data to suggest that it might be as much as 10% to 20% of, um, of, of children with pneumonia. The, the other thing that I just wanted to emphasise is that children who have tuberculosis already have lung damage and so they're very susceptible to having a co-infection then with pneumococcal pneumonia for example. So it may not be just the tuberculosis that is leading to the severe disease and mortality. It may be then having tuberculosis and then, and then developing a secondary pneumococcal pneumonia. It's an important issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, there is a question for Dr. Ajay Mishra. Uh, you have a neonatal care hospital doctor. How many children need NI NICU care in your hospital and what can be done to prevent such hospitalizations? Uh, Dr. Mishra. Dr. Mishra, can you hear me? Please unmute yourself. Yes. Yes, yes I am. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes, yes, we hello. can hear you. Mm. Yes, hello. Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. Earlier I said also said that uh, we know the risk factor, causes and treatment of the pneumonia. We know the pneumonia. We know the treatment of the pneumonia. And we know the cause factor, causes, risk factors. But even then the question again arises how how we can prevent the pneumonia in india yes. there are so what's the answer to that yes hello mm -hmm. hello yes this what is, is the, the answer to that yes uh, this is the question of mine to everybody and uh, but the neonatal care in india is very poor mm -hmm. there are in vicinity there are no doctors are avail available at the centers. So the birth sepsisia cases, pneumonia cases are very common due to the sepsis and the ventilation problem. So hello? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Hello. Hello. So yes. uh, we already mentioned earlier that the treatment we which give in our NICU is the higher antibiotics because the lower antibiotics already given in the primary centers and the patient which come to our centers are already taken the basic antibiotic. So we have to give the higher antibiotics and to the patient having the higher antibiotics are immune to pneumonia and they because the correction uh, I think I think pneumonia, which is uh, very much common in our NICU, and uh, can not be cured by all these antibiotics. And uh, we even treat by our best, but to some extent, patient mortality is very high. As we are uh, earlier mentioned, that there are there are four lakhs death annually in India due to pneumonia and this is all due to lack of knowledge in the interiors. So, so more, more awareness is needed? And yes, 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 yes. More uh, awareness uh, is needed and this is the lack of public and government partnership in India and so it's my question to everybody. Anna, how thank we you for can... bringing out this point. Yes, thank you for bringing out this point. That ending pneumonia needs action from not just doctors but a range of health and non health actors as well. I think yes, that's, yes, that's yes. an important one. Yes, yes. Okay, we have one, one last question. Sorry, we are running short of time, and I would request the participants to please mail your questions uh, or ask them uh, right, uh, right away. Uh, then, uh, this question is uh, from uh, a journalist from Nepal, wants to know that there is a lot of emphasis on childhood pneumonia, and rightly so. But what about pneumonia in adults? 
and we hear of many deaths in adults and elderly people dying due to secondary infection of pneumonia. Are there any vaccines to prevent pneumonia in elderly? And uh, what needs to be done more there? Any of the panelists can answer this question. Maybe I can jump in um, yes, to please. talk about some of the vaccine strategies for adults. So um, extremely important question. And uh, um, you're absolutely right to point out that there have not been um, uh, sort of global level efforts around adult disease and especially around adult infectious diseases. Um, but I do want to point out that pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which um, protects against the most common types of pneumococcal bacterium, which is the most common cause of um, bacterial death uh, from pneumonia in children. It's also an extremely common cause of pneumonia deaths um, and pneumonia illness in the elderly especially, but also other adults. And a special aspect of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine given to infants is that there is um, protection of adults even though they themselves have not been vaccinated. And the reason is that um, the, the bacterium uh, that causes pneumococcal pneumonia is carried in the noses of normal healthy people. And the vaccine protects not only against disease from pneumococcus, but it also protects against carrying this germ in the nose. And because children are the people in the community who are most likely to transmit that germ to their adult contacts, when we vaccinate young infants and children, we indirectly protect adults from being exposed to the bacterium and then they cannot get sick from it because they don't even have exposure to it. So it's one of the um, somewhat unintended but very powerful um, uh, indirect effects of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and especially in low income countries, the magnitude of this effect has not yet been quantified among adults, but I can tell you that in some high income countries, the number of deaths that are prevented in adults as a result of vaccination of infants is much, much higher than the number of deaths that are prevented in the infants who are the age group that is intended for vaccination. So it's an extremely important preventive strategy and a beautiful strategy for adults because they don't even have to receive the vaccine. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much for enlightening us about this. Mm -hmm. And with this, we come to an end of our webinar. We thanks to all the panelists and participants for being with us today. Have a good day with the hope that no child dies of pneumonia. Thank you. Thank you.